Welcome and thank you for joining us for this virtual discussion hosted by the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. It's Wednesday, April 3rd. I'm Jonathan Chanzer, Senior Vice President for Research here at FDD. Today's panel will discuss the outcomes and implications both domestically and internationally of Turkey's local elections. The AKP and by extension, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan suffered their greatest electoral defeat. By comparison, the main opposition Republican People's Party, the CHP, delivered their best electoral performance since 1977. Many observers assume that these local elections were inconsequential because Erdogan won the presidency last year, but that was wrong. The country appears to have lost confidence in Erdogan, they've lost confidence in the AKP, and they've lost confidence in their government. Is this finally the beginning of the end for Erdogan? in power as president until 2028, Erdogan will be, but does he have a clear mandate after these elections? I'm now pleased to introduce our panel for today's discussion. Uh, Guldem Atabay is the former director of research and strategy at Ageli and Company Asset Management in Istanbul. She also served as Turkey economist for broker Unicredit Menkul Değerler, chief economist at Express in Invest, and economist at Raymond James Securities. Guldem has an MA in economics from Hacettepe University in Ankara. Sinan Gidi is a research fellow here at FTD, our non-resident research fellow, and he's an expert on Turkish domestic politics and foreign policy. Sinan was the executive director of the Institute of Turkish Studies based at Georgetown University and continues to serve as an adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He was born in Turkey and educated in the UK. Howard Eisenstadt is an associate professor of Middle East history at St. Lawrence University. Howard's research focuses on nationalism and Islam in the 19th century Ottoman Empire, as well as the history of the Turkish Republic. His recent work has focused on contemporary Turkish domestic and foreign policy, especially on issues of rule of law, minority rights, and the reshaping of political culture under the AKP. Attila Yeshalada is a renowned political analyst and commentator. He is known throughout the finance and political science world for his thorough and outspoken coverage of Turkey's political and financial developments. In addition to his extensive writing schedule, he is often called upon to provide his political expertise on major radio and television networks. Moderating today's conversation will be Yavuz Baydar. Yavuz is the editor-in-chief of Ahbal, a trilingual independent online news site focusing on Turkey. Since the attempted coup of 2016, he has lived in exile in Europe. He was among the co-founders of the independent media platform P24, which aimed to monitor the media sector and the state of journalism in Turkey. Before we dive into our feature discussion, a few words about FTD. For more than 20 years, FTD has operated as a fiercely independent, nonpartisan research institute exclusively focused on national security and foreign policy. As a point of pride and principle, we do not accept foreign government funding. For more on our work, please visit our website, ftd.org, and follow us on Twitter or X at FTD. That's enough for me now. Yavuz, over to you. Yavuz, you're on mute. I'll uh, say hello again, everyone. Marking its centennial, still ongoing until late October this year, Turkey undergoes a period of massive political tremors accompanied by a series of deep crises topped by one, topped by the one shattering the economy. An irony or a wink of history, as Howard might perhaps agree. Political ground is a rugged terrain, and the citizenry, uh, to use a term by Professor Hamid Bozarslan, lobotomized two consecutive elections, on one in uh, last May, ending with the victory of uh, President Erdogan in power alliance, and the one four days ago, delivering him, after 22 years of iron rule, severest blow, lifting the main opposition above the dominant AKP in numbers. In rough terms, what we have witnessed, witnessed in March 2031 is this, with a turnout lower by six percentage points than the average ever, 78%, main opposition CHP landed as the first party by 37.7%, 7 
as the AKP losing nearly 10 percentage points, coming down to 35.5%. <laughs> the AKP lost 8 million voters nationwide, meaning its city municipalities declined from 39 to 24. CHP's gains were significant from 21 to 36. And another blow for the AKP was the solid stance of the pro Kurdish Dam Party in the mainly Kurdish province Southeast Party, increasing its city municipalities from 8 to 10. Puzzling situation, to say the least. And uh, probably uh, we'll begin the word puzzle. Um, how deeply were you surprised by the by the result and why? Just brief answers, please, beginning from Howard. I, I think that uh, for my, myself, I, I didn't have uh, a real confidence about what the outcome was. Uh, this was certainly a much bigger win for the opposition than I expected. Uh, but given the state of the economy and the different stakes in municipal elections over national elections, uh, the opposition did better than expected, but I think everybody expected them to do well. You're done? Well, it was the latest polls of last week before the elections that it was showing uh, the Istanbul and Ankara will be strongly gained by the opposition CHP, but the surprise was mainly uh, in the inner Anatolia uh, parts of uh, Turkey. So that was a big surprise. And the melting down of the opposition E party uh, perfectly well into CHP voters. That was another big surprise. So this is basically it. Attila, were you caught by a surprise by this result? Extremely. After the May elections, I thought democracy in Turkey was uh, almost done. Erdogan was almost certain to win the local elections because the entire opposition were in disarray. Mm -hmm. And he would streamroll over the opposition. Over the last month, I came to think, based on polls and expert commentary, that CHP will keep the three major cities. But as Güldem said, I had not expected them to do so well in the interior parts of the Anatolia, as well as grabbing several major mm -hmm. boroughs in Istanbul and Ankara. Big magnitude and, indeed. Um, and, and Sinan? I mean, I'm surprised that it took this long for a electoral earthquake to hit the AKP. I remember the fallout from the 2001 election in, you know, the 2002 election following the 2001 financial crisis in Turkey, which just uh, uh, you know, uh, bludgeoned the the DSP led government at the time because of just the sheer economic uh, uh, fallout, and I, arguably the conditions today are worse. So it, it took the electorate, I think, some time. But I'm also surprised at the level of complacency on part of the governing party, simply because, you know, I, I've, beca I've, come, I've become accustomed to thinking, you know, what is Erdogan thinking that I'm not thinking of, right? Just these mm -hmm. lackluster mayoral candidates for big cities like Istanbul and Ankara. You know, we assumed or some of us assumed that essentially he was going to pull another rabbit out of the hat. And it basically just did not happen. And on the, you know his concession speech, he was weak. He looked deflated and just just worn out. Maybe he was weaker than ever. Uh, let's uh, continue with the main takeaways. Uh, what are the most striking takeaways? How do we explain, for example, the severe contradiction between the election, the results in May 23 and elections and this one, main reasons of the results. How, how do we read into this? Uh, again, uh, the word is, uh, the floor is with Howard. Um, so I guess I, I would point to three things that, that distinguish the elections this time versus the elections in May and June. Uh, the first is, uh, as Sinan noted, the, the lackluster candidates on the part of the AKP. Um, I think that there's a logic to why they were chosen, but it turned out to be a bad logic. They were terrible on the uh, campaign trail. Uh, the second, I would say, is that uh, the AKP took uh, a tremendous effort to uh, keep inflation in check in advance of the May and June elections. Uh, once it began to sort of normalize uh, economic policy, then the real burdens of a decade of mismanagement became evident and uh, uh, Turkish voters uh, were feeling it acutely uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And the third is that because these are municipal elections, the calculations on the 
part of the electorate are quite different. They tend to be more strategic. They tend to be more focused on um, goods and services. They're less concerned with sort of the big cultural issues that uh, the AKP uh, tends to, to uh, capitalize on in general elections. Mm -hmm. And Sinan? I mean, we could spend forever talking about this, but I'll make a few brief comments that, that struck out to me. I, the first thing that might be a takeaway was if this was a game of battleships, um, I think Erdogan's flagship has just been mortally wounded. And it's, I think the, you know, my assumption at this point is this will be very hard for him to turn this around uh, administratively, economically, but also from a perspective of DNA design and just how Erdogan responds to defeat, which we've seen very few times. But um, it, it really is a, a, a horrific defeat for him. And he's not accustomed to that. And I don't necessarily know what he's going to do about it. The initial conversations that he seems to have had with his cabinet, again, is play the blame game, fire a bunch of people, but never touch him. He seems to be like nobody seems to identify that essentially he might be the object of the problem at this stage. The second thing I took away from this is, you know, uh, it, it's bittersweet at some level for uh, Mayor Ekrem Imamoglu, which I think is the biggest winner out of all of this, right? As you know, he's really elevated himself to the national uh, stage. I am going to go on record here and basically say at some stage in, in, in the future, I, I believe we're going to see a president, Imamoglu, um, if the presidential system remains, uh, or a prime minister if it does not. And not um, Mansur Yavash. And not Mansur Yavash. Not Mansur Yavash, no. I think, you know, the, the Imamoglu factor is just compelling. You can, you can see that X factor that Turkish uh, <laughs> politics seldom display in terms of just how um, persuasive they can be of the electorate. And it's bittersweet. I say it's bittersweet because I just look at this and think, um, I, I watched his victory speech, as did many of us, and think, well, you know, had Kemal Kılıç not insisted and imposed his candidacy last year on, on, on, on the Nation Alliance, and Imam Oğlu was allowed to run as the presidential candidate, I can't help but think that on, on, on Sunday night, we could have possibly witnessed the president Imam Oğlu congratulating the CHP for its, you know, splendid, you know, local election performance. And so, you know, in my opinion, that's been, you know, denied him. Um, and he won about by the same percentage points uh, as mayor in Samoa, which I, honestly is not the same comparison. He won about by the same margin as he was projected to defeat Erdogan last year as president. Mm -hmm. A uh, political earthquake indeed, Güldem. Uh, your takeaways, um, this is, of course, uh, there are losers and winners uh, in this one. Um, there are many losers and uh, there are also a few winners, maybe just one. How do you see that from that perspective? Uh, well, from, from political perspective, the losers are... Uh... Are definite. It's it's the opposition has consolidated under CHP. That's that's that's a fact. That seems like a fact. The the Kurdish uh, dam exists on stage. Uh, CHP as the main opposition party, and of course the emergence of Yeniden Refah Partisi, the small Islamist party uh, that took six points something, six point one I think percent mm -hmm. of the votes. Uh, I think it's there to stay for a while uh, since there are the reaction votes to Erdogan's uh, pop. Adon's way of, of managing economy and way of managing its, its relations with Israel under the current uh, circumstances. So these are uh, basically uh, the winners and the losers in my, in my opinion. But the winners will be shaped in the future again. I, I think er, around Erdogan there will be people who will stay along with him, like with Mehmet Şimşek. I think he's one of the guys that, who will stay because there's no other way. Out, other way. Minister of Would Economy, you? yes. Minister of Economy, as the Minister of um, in control of everything in the economy, uh, because if he's he's eliminated, we'll directly go into an, an, another uh, very hard, very rough uh, current account crisis in Turkey very immediately, and there will be early elections, and everything will be messy, messier than ever uh, in Turkish economy for the near term. Uh, I think he'll stay. The the losers, I don't know. Erdogan will pick. Uh, I, I think the the previous guys who were in charge of the economy are responsible. But then again, it was President Erdogan's directions that they've uh, covered uh, during that time, during 2018 and 2023. So Erdogan mm -hmm. has to look at himself, uh, and I, I don't think he will ever do that uh, in that sense. And CHP is is is it's it's 
future depends on whether it will be successful as it is in, in Istanbul and Ankara across An Anatolia. Uh, so that will that's something we'll have to see uh, for the time mm -hmm. in the time of it. Attila, main takeaway, it seems, uh, as I read The Economists, uh, looking at the reasons why uh, this eight percentage point loss, the bleeding, the massive bleeding of AKP, um, they saw a main reason as, as the uh, main takeaway also as uh, the, the, the, the slap on the face by the pension holders, especially. Uh, and it seems, uh, if you look at the latest report by Yenishafak, uh, reporting from the uh, Central Committee meeting, Erdogan was speaking and mentioning that he failed, in his own terms, of course, he failed to deliver uh, for them uh, the, the, whatever uh, the pension holders expected. Is it also your takeaway from, uh, from, the, from these elections that, uh, the, it, it, that it's the economy is stupid? It is largely the economy, though I would like to complement the views of the previous speakers with some nuances. Clearly, pensioners wanted more. And I think first time ever Erdogan understood that there are limits to pork barreling, giving them what they want would have collapsed the budget and it would have led to an irreversible calamity. But there is another economic aspect that hasn't been discussed in this panel which is that these election results are, to a large extent, the payback for his crony regime. Now, Erdogan's connections to big construction, contracting companies, etc., are not things that matter to the daily lives of people in the cities. But when you become poorer by day and see everyone that's associated with the municipality, AKP, and Islamic tariqats get rich and also advocate to you more poverty, you react. And I think that's one aspect of these elections that will not, cannot change. Erdogan's is a crony regime and he cannot change the uh, main tenets of that. Finally, we need, again, my personal view, Erdogan, his family and AKP no longer represent the true Islamist streak in Turkey. That role has now reverted to new welfare party. Mm -hmm. This is the first major and irreversible split in the long tradition of Turkish political Islam. The last one was Erdogan and his colleagues splitting from legendary Erdogan in late 1990s. Interesting. You call it irreversible split. Yeah. Some, some other observers see that as a sort of, you know, temporary migration uh, from uh, AKP to, to Yeniden Ref, to the welfare, new welfare party. No, I think the economic votes, the economic dissent, can be reversed we can talk about that but the, all polls identify 12 to 15 maybe 18 percent of turkish voters are hardcore islamist and ideology does matter to them mm -hmm. and for them erdogan is no longer the representative of that tradition i can cite various reasons from lgbt you know L lgbtq is infectious of course and erdogan is not doing anything about it but the handshake with Sisi cost him. But most importantly, I think we need to take Turkey's Islamic tradition seriously. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people believe in the tenets of the Quran, you know, modest living, humble humility, etc. Erdogan and AKP no longer represent these. So in my view, they're looking for a new home. And as long as that ideological base is intact, they're going to keep mm -hmm. voting for new welfare, which is going to become a self-reinforcing cycle in the sense that New welfare will gain 7% of the vote in the next elections and will get significant representation in the Grand Assembly. Okay. Uh, I know, Sinan, you want to ask a question to, to economists, but uh, it can be taken a little bit later because uh, where we are at the moment is, is that we came to an interesting point uh, to speaking about uh, the lose loser, the AKP, but as a uh, in my conversation with Professor Azar Senjar, congratulating him for his prediction, uh, he mentioned uh, something, he said something interesting. He said, general elections are general elections, but in each and every local election, uh, this is uh, some sort of a um, verdict for the for the voter uh, of the uh, you know performance after each and every general election. So this is where we are. This is sort of a lesson uh, to, to, to deliver to, to the political actors. But Howard, uh, we spoke about the AKP, and in in in line with that, um, can we speak about 
has some claim um, uh, because you, you know CHP now ending as the first party since 1977 and another uh, top position in 1989. Uh, historically speaking, what does it signify? Kemalism on the rise or a strong message from the electorate to, to end polarization, kind of an alignment or call for normality uh, or a massive wave of protest votes seeking temporary shelter by way of migrating out of Erdogan and also from E party, I suppose, and massively, yeah. of course, tactical votes from them party. Uh, how do you see the CHP's current uh, situation? So uh, I guess I'd like to make two points. In the, uh, I, and I, I'll always defer to Sinan, who after all wrote the book on the CHP, mm -hmm. uh, on issues of the CHP. But I, I think that the CHP has actually taken a page out of the early AKP in that the early AKP sort of presented itself as a party of effective governance and uh, providing services. And I think at the municipal level, at least, that's what the CHP did this time. And that's what Turkish voters want, particularly from the municipal government. Um, I, I guess I'd, I'd also like to just interject that I'm less, uh, I think, less, uh, optimistic or uh, less pessimistic, as it were, about the AKP's long-term future than my, my colleagues on the panel. I, I, think that, I think there's a danger of overreading municipal elections, uh, particularly um, in, in a moment of uh, high economic crisis. I think that there are lots of ways in which the AKP can write itself both politically and through the uh, intensification of authoritarian tools, as we, we saw in uh, Bonn this week, where, where the, the, can, the candidate, the Dem candidate was uh, elected and, and was not allowed to take office. We, that's, that's been a pattern after the uh, uh, 2016 elections. It's a pat, uh, pattern that continued uh, uh, after the last municipal elections, I I don't I don't think that we can uh, we can assume that the AKP has lost its either its political gas. There are lots of ways that it can correct itself for the next four years, and uh, or uh, has lost access to its authoritarian tools. Mm -hmm. uh, Sinan, you know, current barometer shows, of course, uh, the the the big changes and. Uh, as again, uh, referring to Professor Sanjar, my conversation with him, he mentioned, underlined something. He said, he said it is important that for me, uh, the CHP ended not as a first party. These were, I mean, this is a de facto, maybe a different situation. Uh, it may seem higher points, but, um, and he was saying this to, to deliver hopes that the CHP leadership uh, would read into this, this this situation more carefully and more deeply than ever before. Uh, where did the votes come from? Uh, support votes, tactical votes, and uh, what the, the vote overall means. But again, the same question. Uh, uh, there are some interpretations that you know the current, you know, or historically into historic context, uh, the the votes again, you know, uh, swinging between. Uh, uh, sort of, you know, conservative vote and back to like in 77 to, to uh, you know, centristic party, Republican party, CHP. Uh, you know, you are an expert on CHP. How do you see that? Um, so we haven't seen the breakdown of the numbers and we'll have to wait, see what, you know, what this, you know, who voted how in, in each province and whatever, that, that will take time to process. But my initial thought is, um, Looking at the CHP's sort of quote success has to be probably tempered, I would say, you know, the 37 point whatever percentage of the vote it got. I think it really has to be tempered because my my my honest opinion on this is, is it's not really comparable to the success it achieved in 1977 or during the 70s under the prolific rise of, you know, Bulent Ejevit, right? I say that because, you know, the Ejevit successes that really elevated the party's popular standing were not just limited to the leader's charisma. But the party itself really did reorient itself and really invest in its sort of appearance, its ideology, its its doctrinal strength, at the, at, according to the conditions of the times, which really attracted labor unions, 
have, you know, became organically linked to a lot of voters that really was programmatically recognizable. If you look at the CHP under Özgür Özel, the, you know, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, Deniz Baykal, I would say the one uniting factor in all of them is, is this is, for me, organization is still a clown show. I mean, one of the things that we would still, I would still iterate is, you know, the Nation Alliance, which ran last year, has basically been decimated. It's, it's, it's just gone, you know, the, the, led by the CHP that was trying to defeat Erdogan, right? Um, we've seen a blustery Özgür Özel. We don't really know what the CHP stands for. I think the votes delivered to the CHP are more representative now of just an exasperated, you know, public in Turkey who just do not feel they have an, an another outlet other than to vote for the main opposition, which looks probably for now less crooked, less corrupt, less incompetent. And I say that in a tempered manner because if you could compose an opposition field of parties and politicians that really wanted to lose this local election, you would do exactly what they did in the last three months. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, you, you look at characters like Meral Akşener, you look at, you know, um, you know, even Özgür Özel, who was not really, I think, really hitting hard and programmatically on targeting things like law, rule of law issues, the, mm -hmm. the, the absolute collapse of the econ economy, I wanted him to stand up there some, at some point like Erdal Inunu in the early 1990s and squeeze a lemon and say, this regime mm. is squeezing you to the core. And that was going to be the main question that I had for the economists, which we can touch upon later, but I just want to plant mm. in the back of their mind. Um, if you could possibly just lay out for our listeners and just, I don't think people necessarily know in the United States or Europe, just how bad the economy is in Turkey and what it means for the average person. It's mm -hmm. at some stage, but that's my answer for now. Uh, a question to, to Gildem and, and Attila uh, in, in, you know, in continuity with that. Um, we now know, I think you may all agree, that uh, there was an implosion, uh, definitely for Meral Akşener's E-Party, uh, for, for the, the great disappointment maybe for its supporters, but uh, delight for the others, because uh, to many her choreography was was uh, really mind-boggling uh, and uh, finally uh, she was delivered a very bad verdict but also implosion in terms of numbers were noted for because this was a test uh, and uh, noted for Ahmet Davutoğlu's Gelecek Partisi which won only 34,000 nationwide uh, votes and uh, Ali Babacan's Deva Party 138 some thousand and those parties are basically uh, off the map uh, one could say uh, but very disproportionately represented in, in, in, in the current parliament. Uh, something to discuss, maybe. But uh, again, back to um, the, the you know, table of six, last year's hope booster is gone. Uh, the, the sort of consensus seeking is gone. And uh, maybe Turkey, if uh, the conjuncture allows, we don't know, uh, goes to a sort of a two or three party system. Uh, can we foresee that? Okay, okay, I'll try. I'll try my shot. My sh sh shot. Uh, well, we're not there yet. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, Mr. Jidia said, it's, it's the, the CHP is, is, has gained a lot of votes that it didn't really expect it to uh, win in this election. So it's, it's very strong. But whether it will ride with the strength and really uh, restructure the party is yet to be seen. Uh, so whether this this kind of uh, votes will stay with them uh, or uh, there'll be uh, maybe a change of leadership within E-Party, which I really do not expect to see it emerging again, but some things will change and uh, CHP might be losing this, the, the votes that it has gained in a couple of years' time ahead. So we, we, we don't know that. The, the, uh, the, the party will be managed by, obviously, uh, Mr. Özgür Özel, the party leader. Uh, İmamoğlu, as the Istanbul mayor, everybody's looking up to him. What, what he does, what, where he signals, what he says is, is, is really important. And Mr. Yavaş, even he says that uh, he will not be running for another round in Ankara uh, mayorship. Uh, whether he'll stay, uh, will he'll run for a presidential election is yet to be seen. So maybe CHP will have struggles within its so we're not there yet, but mm -hmm. obviously, uh, in in the ish, 
in the events of one that we uh, saw today, that CHP deputies there uh, having a walk on, on the streets together with the Kurdish uh, people, the Kurdish party them, uh, members, top level members, it's something new for Turkey because CHP was always like uh, looking from the sidelines to support the Kurdish votes, Kurdish parties, and even if this uh, the, they were being elected for, for, for local uh, governments and they were just being removed from it, CHP was really uh, not taking sides with them so things are changing in turkey and i think things will get faster to change in the, in the years ahead so i don't know the answer to your question whether we have two or three parties in the years ahead but mainly if this current system stays we'll have the kurds obviously we'll have a, a right party a center right party and islam's party in in current currently as mm -hmm. akp and yender refa and chp stands a very, at a very strong position to attract the other votes uh, within the mm -hmm. country. So three parties, yes, four or five, I don't know. <laughs> the time mm -hmm. show, I think. Attila, do you know? Yes, I do. I always know. It's a good assessment, so we need to analyze the situation at the level of the presidential contest and the parliamentary elections. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, from the viewpoint of the presidential election, Turkey has moved to a two-party system. Uh, there would be Erdogan and whoever rivals him. The others will at the end support Erdogan's rival. In the parliamentary system, it's more nuanced. Turkey has a very long parliamentary tradition. It's based on several parties. And also the split in the Islamist tradition, as well as the renewed strength of anti-immigrant party, a one-issue party, but an issue that is becoming permanent, as well as the partial rise of the left, tells me that Turkey shall remain in a multi-party system. If I have the time, I would like to say, I would like to run a tally of how much of CHP's success is due to one of events and how much of it can be considered permanent. Mm -hmm. um, now, maybe Howard, um, we all see uh, and seem to agree, there is a widespread agreement that this result uh, places an enormous responsibility for for C for the CHP uh, because it has been the hub of um, you know magnetic field of so many so many votes and uh, day one on day two day three we have already seen uh, what might give uh, hints of what uh, Erdogan and his government his power alliance could do reflecting spilling over to the predominantly Kurdish uh, provinces and the one being the center of uh, riots because the, the the elected Mir Abdullah Zaydan, elected by 55 plus percent, is denied uh, his right to resume uh, mayorship. Uh, and this led to, this was a spark that, that, ex, that led to an explosion now. The riots are still continuing as a result. Bitlis and Van are basically close to entries and uh, exits. And also curfew is declared in Seert Perwari uh, town. Um, Howard, looking at it from the historic perspective, we have seen this uh, trustee appointments uh, massively in uh, following the 2019 local elections. And also we have, we remember the, the wave of violence and the dark times following the general elections 2015, the summer, the dark summer. Are we seeing the same movie and why again? Because people should have gotten used to this and it's still the same scenes. Yeah, I mean, I think that that um, it's it's relatively easy for uh, the AKP to uh, target, um, you know, prior uh, HDP and now Dem. Uh, I think the uh, there's there's a um, a fairly significant portion, uh, probably a majority of Turkish citizens are quite okay with. Uh, with uh, pushing uh, pro-Kurdish uh, voices to the periphery, jailing them, uh, uh, taking them out of uh, office. There was no popular uproar when they did it to the HDP. I, I don't expect uh, there to necessarily be a uh, terrible popular uproar this time around. I'm, I'm glad the CHP is uh, uh, is stepping forward. It did not do so uh, the last time around. Um, but uh, the, the, to me, the bigger question is, uh, 
is the AKP willing to go after CHP municipalities as well? Uh, the the prosecution of Imam Olu is ongoing. Um, I and think the, the trial the, trial is dated on um, April twenty five. The the risks and costs are of course much harder. Repression is easy, but it's not free for an authoritarian government. And I think that the costs of uh, uh, open repression of the CHP is much higher than the cost of open repression of uh, Dem. Um, but yeah, I, I am, um, I think that it's, it's going to be a, a uh, rough go. I don't, I don't expect uh, the AKP to, uh, to simply take the loss uh, uh, and and uh, uh, move on. I, I expect them to use every tool in their very large uh, uh, quiver uh, to to to uh, regain power and and regain access to rent. Whether that means transferring more uh, more responsibilities over to the governors, that's a possibility. Whether it means additional uh, uh, trials, that's a possibility. Um, you know, we the the municipalities won uh, uh, the opposition won municipalities, and that's that's a very good thing. But the control of the courts, control of uh, security services, control of uh, the uh, the executive is still in the hands of the AKP. And um, while it's this is not Putin's Russia, it's not Sisi's Egypt. It is also uh, not. Uh, a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Sinan, it seems uh, by what uh, the comment of, of uh, the Howard that the, this is a sort of a test drive for for the for CHP to see from the you know vantage point of Erdogan how democratically resilient this time the party will be uh, and uh, and and wise enough uh, taking lessons from the from before. Will will will the CHP be able to be up to it? Um. We'll see, uh, but just to, to, to reflect on that and, and, and bounce off something um, that Howard just outlined, I agree with this. Um, look, what's at stake for Erdogan right now? He's no idiot, he's no sort of you know uh, rookie at this. What's at stake for him now based on Sunday's result is I would argue existential. He really sees for the first time, as do his apparatchiks and lips, uh, you know, Lickspittles, right? Who've who've supported this regime? Come, you know, high, you know, whatever, right? They're they're worried about can this be sustained? So Erdogan, I I would argue, is in this sort of holding pattern of processing, understanding, and per Howard's comment of like the cost of repression, he's probably calculating, has to be calculating, what do I need to do in order to sort of you know you know you know retain but augment my base of power, given that I've just lost quite heavily, and this will be really hard to turn around. I don't think he goes about it by essentially democratizing or, you know, making a more accountable government, because that's also a loss for him. I think most of the options for Erdogan are bad in terms of what he does. Ultimately, I think it will falter. I, I don't know the timeline of this, but he's trying to, I would, in my estimation, sort of put forward a heads I win, tails you lose. The Van, Hakkari, Sirt, uh, uh, other provinces, which has escalated in violence over the last 24 hours, you know, with, you know, uh, uh, uh, AKP uh, gunmen wandering around the streets firing Kalashnikovs. You know, the, the logic there seems to me, as best as we can point out, is let's cause chaos, right, um, and contest sort of the ability of, in the case of, a, a, you know, Van, the, where the Dem, you know, the Kurds won, you know, got nearly twice as many as votes as the AKP guy who have not been given power, right? Oh. And the more they protest, they'll just label them as terrorists, right? And and bang them up and be denied power. And again, that's the big question that Howard asked is, will he stop with with with the Kurds and, and the southeastern provinces? I look at somewhere like Istanbul, um, and Imam Oulu for him as Erdogan, Erdogan is the consummate sort of, you know, balance of power. He, he understands that Imam Oulu is his main nemesis now. He's, he's, he's clobbered Erdogan three times since 2019 in quite humiliating ways. Mm -hmm. I don't think he has the luxury of just ignoring that or leaving Imam Oulu attended, unattended to just go on ruling Istanbul at the same time as Imam Oulu now beginning to clearly construct a national platform and policy agenda. 
He's come out in the opposition of what's happening in Iran. Um, he said things like he's investing in future things like, you know, I, I should learn Kurdish, he says, because he's investing in the Kurdish vote as a, as a likely presidential candidate. Um, the problem that he has with Imam Ola, obviously, is Imam Ola right now is about as strong as he can be. I mean, it's hard to just, you know, uh, slap that political ban on him at the appeals court because this guy just won over one out of two votes out of 11 million people who voted in Istanbul. If they yeah. uphold that ban and, you know, remove him from office, Erdogan has to worry about how far will those repercussions be? Because my estimation, I'm just guessing here, is that it will not be limited to Istanbul, that people across the country will say enough is enough. And he's probably calculating the repression cost of this, but it's clear that he cannot leave Imam Ola unattended. Mm. Um, now, uh, we, those who predicted, those who might be called um, uh, pessimists, uh, saying that the political uh, Islamists uh, will never leave power easily, will not go quietly, uh, will not concede defeat, um, historically speaking, political history. Uh, those may be right, maybe reading these these hints uh, of Erdogan's uh, choice now becoming the hard way, maybe. But um, there is also the economy, uh, Gildem. Um, uh, the, the main reason, as uh, the panel agrees, I think, uh, the reason for, for, the, for the current result. Uh, what might be the choices of, of Erdogan now, economically speaking? Uh, because the, the, the cornered, he's cornered, uh, and uh, um, the way out is a big question mark. Yeah, and and uh, uh, as I was listening to Mr. Sinanjidi, uh, he's he's he's uh, tightening his iron grasp on on the southeastern provinces. Is not going to help in his quest uh, to uh, attract foreign investment in the country. So he has to find a fine balance, tone down in the days ahead, so that Mr. Mehmet Shimshek will take stage and do whatever he does. And going back to your question from the start uh, on the economy mm -hmm. front, it's it's. I think the roadmap is easy. In the short term, he has Mr. Shimshek at his hand. Uh, he's going to be using him uh, for the next twelve to eighteen months uh, to do uh, to attract foreign investment. I think we're going to be further rate hikes from the central bank in April and May. Uh, maybe combined uh, in April and May. Maybe only in April, uh, as the foreign investors are going to be asking for more uh, yields. Given the, uh, I think, in my opinion, political risks. Have escalated in Turkey with uh, uncertain future uh, for the AKP uh, rising, uh, rose after the elections, uh, having risen after the elections, and and I think there we will see further tax hikes uh, on nationwide VAT hikes uh, in the days ahead. Uh, they'll be trying to uh, land more the, on on selective uh, sectors uh, that are focused mostly on on export uh, exports uh, in, in in Europe, uh, and will will be some uh, spending cuts on investments and that's basically it i mean uh, as long as erdogan is there and the system doesn't change uh, we don't have uh, any further uh, room to have a uh, vision uh, for the future of, of, of the turkish economy changing profoundly uh, without any leap on the democratic front so i think uh, that's the only thing that he can do is in the next couple of uh, one or two years that he can uh, be successful and that success will be um, painful for the public more painful uh, for the public than it was in the last uh, three or five months uh, or last 10 months let's say since uh, the appointment of Mr. Mehmet Simshek as the Minister of Economy uh, so his, his, uh, his uh, room is like limited to 2024 for the rest of it and, and 2025 and 2026 who knows where we'll be <laughs> but mm -hmm. we'll be attracting a few billion dollars for for the turkish equity market and for the one market perhaps i uh, will be adding a couple of billions to the reserves but the basic picture uh, will not change turkish economy will slow down uh, very rapidly the turkish people will be suffering uh, f uh, as they're paying the cost of the previous economic policy mistakes uh, that was also made by uh, the erdogan uh, himself uh, and his man uh, now his new man is trying to reverse the situation around uh, and the cost will be high there will be no early elections no uh, constitutional referendum the the economic environment doesn't really permit that uh, and i think he has to be uh, controlling his his a uh, repression uh, urge uh, to just to keep the foreign flows coming into the country. 
uh, early elections are out of the question because Turkey is unable to hold another election economy, as, as many point out. But success, as uh, Gürdem says, Attila, can it be really sustainable uh, on increased collective pain on, on, the, on the society? Uh, how do you see the, the, the way out for, for Erdogan in, in the economy? First of all, and I need to emphasize this point that uh, at the risk of uh, reiterating what has been said before, I think A, Erdogan is as shocked as by these results as CHP and I myself. He will make his final decision regarding economic policy at the end of Eid, the religious uh, holiday. Had he won Istanbul, I would have said he would have immediately started negotiations on a new constitution, early elections, whatever. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Güldem. That, that doesn't make sense. So my bias is towards thinking that Erdogan is going to be much more flexible in terms of giving Mehmet Şimşek the authority to do, quote-unquote, whatever it takes. And yeah... Yeah, if your object is reducing inflation to, say, 20% and monthly inflation to 1%, a sustainable current account deficit, yeah, these can be achieved. It takes about a year, some pain, but with elections long way away in the horizon, why does Erdogan care? What cannot be changed, and this is why we need to understand that even a well-performing economy may not deliver Erdogan to victory next time is income distribution because it's not necessarily caused by the very structure of the Turkish economy, but by Erdogan's crony regime, as well as what I call the informal case system in Turkey. Regardless of my merits, as say, as an Elevite or a Kurd, mm -hmm. there is no way I can make money in Turkey. This is how bad it is. So, yeah, stabilization is perfectly possible and we can even have a virtuous cycle of financial flows being followed by FTI. I'm not going to waste the time of this uh, audience mm -hmm. with uh, my line, my uh, sideline issues, but if Trump is re-elected and if EU ends its navel gazing and starts new negotiations on a customs union, which is basically cost-free for EU, then we could even see some FTI flowing into Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, Atilabe, can I just ask something, and, and to Gudan sure. too? Look, my understanding of the economy is very rudimentary. I've got a B- minus in macroeconomics in college, so I'm very proud of that. Um, but my, my understanding of this has always been, look, if Erdogan was serious about, you know, restructuring the economy back to an even keel, right, to to, to, to attract voters and make people, you know, satisfied, then it, it, the approach to me is basically allowing Mehmet Şimşek to project a course similar to what uh, Kemal Darvish was allowed to do in 2001, right, which is, leave, you know, I don't care about the politics, I want a free hand, spending has got to be constrained by the government, you know, income, you know, printing money to pay and continuously increase public salaries, retirement salaries has to stop, which equals public misery. And without that, without actually real suffering to actually heal inflation and allow the current account deficit to fall, right, uh, and restructure the balance of payments of, of the private sector and the government, then, then we're not going to get anywhere. You know, right? and, but, Question. but because it's so painful, um, if you were to implement such a strategy, that's not going to be attractive to voters because they just clobbered him on Sunday. So, you know, how does he... How, is there... Is he serious about economic reform or is it just, you know, punt it down the road day by day and see what happens? Go ahead, Gilda, you're first. Thank you. Well, uh, he cannot be serious about economic reform. He doesn't have the room for that, uh, as you said. He, he, he, he, he's, he's binded himself uh, with the system. So uh, it's, it's, only a, it's only a couple of years of, of, uh, of better macroeconomic management uh, and no other reforms, maybe a few ones like in the uh, employment sector or something. But I don't think there's going to be a profound change during the term of uh, next Erdogan government. Very simple answer. Attila? Yeah, I think uh, the international experience of austerity or belt tightening programs shows us that within 12 to 15 months, the economy bottoms and then moves to a more sustainable path, which also delivers 
prosperity, assuming Erdogan is not scheduling his early election or constitutional change fantasy or, or um, objective to 2027, there is enough time to make the population suffer the pain at the expense of improving economic performance and then give them a good year or two before they forget that and move back to uh, Erdogan's side. But Gildem is quite right. No one has time to discuss these issues. But the real economic issue is how are you going to become a high value added or export driven economy if you don't have any investment in education and even your own business community is now migrating of all countries to Egypt because regulations are easier to understand that. That is not going to change. We're going to get stability, but it should actually be called stagnation. Mm-hmm. Turkey is, and and yeah. that will reflect on even the opposition municipalities. Yeah, so, I, I, I proposed uh, to explain how much of the vote is borrowed from CHP's perspective and how much of it is permanent. Let me just, if you are, if I'm allowed two minutes, let me tell you that. Just one minute, because we are, clock is ticking. I think uh, in presidential elections, CHP and Ekrem Mamolo stay in good stead to beat Erdogan. In parliamentary elections, it's not that simple. Simply because uh, new welfare voters are more likely than not to support Erdogan in a presidential election. Presidential election or general elections 2028. Uh, we are now back to central politics again, Howard, uh, because local election results are there, but uh, parliament is as a composition and Erdogan holds the majority and also potential uh, cooperators like E Party, Meral Akshiner's party and others are there. And uh, the way is still open for, for Erdogan, realistically speaking. So each and every one, you have about uh, about two minutes to go. Uh, please, uh, in, in this context, uh, what do you see? Uh, what is your last word uh, about the future? Howard. So I, I'm not going to predict elections that are four years out. Um, I think that Erdogan um, has envisioned his last, had envisioned his last term as sort of a seamless handoff to a new generation of uh, AKP uh, technocrats, um, his his own son-in-law, uh, for starter. But I but I think Murat Kurum uh, represents. I mean, he was a terrible candidate, but he he represents a sort of person who's come up through the AKP bureaucracy and and could represent um, a a uh, a legacy. That legacy is now very much uh, at risk. I don't know that the. Uh, I'm, I'm less pessimistic about the AKP's long-term future than than I think um, uh, other panelists are, but but I but I do think that Erdogan's going to have to uh, reassert himself into the future of the AKP mm-hmm. in ways that he he may not have planned to. Gulda. Well, I think what we're having is uh, a creative destruction at the moment in Turkish uh, political landscape uh, within CHP. Uh, with the defeat of the AKP, uh, things will be changing. There's going to be further volatility, very severe uncertainty. Uh, economy will not be function at its, at its best, uh, even if Mehmet Simşek was to do the reforms that he would like to. Unless we have an anchor like an IMF, I think things uh, are more... Pr- more or more likely to sour before they get better. And as we were speaking, uh, you know, I wrote you from the back, uh, the one uh, election was given to them party, the, the mayorship back. So that's, I think, a very symbolic of what people can do if they uh, mm-hmm. increase their voices and stand together. I think that's a lesson uh, for the years ahead. Um, I think things will get uh, worse bef- before they get better. Attila, pessimistic or optimistic? I have two pieces of bad news and one piece of good news for our audience. Bad news, I don't want. As long as Erdogan remains in power, Turks or people of Turkey, I'm sorry, obviously we're also Kurds and Arabs. People of Turkey will neither experience social peace, uh, nor prosperity. Two, 
judging the uh, local election results, I cannot make a prediction that Erdogan's days are numbered. These are the bad news. The good news is eventually everyone retires or joins his or her ancestors. And when that unfortunate day happens, the rebound of Turkey at every level from democratization to economic development is going to be incredibly fast because we haven't lost our muscle memory from the first decade of the 21st century. And Sinan, the last word is yours. Um... Um, you, we may have a couple of more minutes outside of my thing, but um, you could do a fire, Sam. But I, I will go. I mean, yeah, I'm going to go with Howard and say I'm not going to predict what's going to happen at the next presidential election because we, we, Turkey seems to be stumbling from one election to the next and we don't seem to get a respite. But I agree. Um, as long as Erdogan's around, you know, I agree, tend to agree with Howard to the extent that I think, you know, don't count him out uh, more the AKP's chances of, you know, tinkering around the edges of authoritarianism to see how much, how, how, and how effectively they can hold on to power both nationally and locally. We'll, that we'll have to, we'll have to see how the weeks and months progress after this. You know, in terms of AKP and, and, and legal actions taken against uh, persons, parties, and entities. Um, what I will say, though, is this: we've been having this discussion in amongst sort of uh, Turkey analysts and watchers for a while, suggesting that Erdogan's ability to name a successor. I think that is a huge flop. If these elections have showed anything. One you know, sort of, you know, leader's ability to nominate his or her successor in Turkish politics has never really been successful. Turkey's political system, as these elections sort of reveal, is just too pluralistic. It's not like Putin's Russia, right, when he just named Medvedev for a while and just see what happens. I think whoever he names, Bayraktar, Soylu, whoever, I don't think it's going to matter because even within his own circles, there will be contenders and naysayers to that. So, name, you know, think Bülent Terenc, think, God, you know, if you can humor me on this, Abdullah Gül. Um, people are going to speak up and just not take it. They're all hungry for power, not to mention like the CHP sort of emerging sort of uh, leadership. I think the successor argument is gone. I think Turkey will, uh, I agree with Atile Bey at that, at, at that point, post Erdogan, there'll be vibrancy. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how quickly it will take for the country to sort of refine its sort of, you know, fast setting after Erdogan, as Atila pointed out, simply because I think the country needs a, a considerable amount of collective therapy, but also the reassertion of institutional governance, rights and wrongs, just the rule of law, respect for the rule of law, just these basics about a new social contract, which Erdogan has, I think, um, torn apart. Um, but I'll also make this prediction, and it's not for the immediate future. The day that Erdogan is finally out of the national picture, one way or another, I think in, in the future we will not, the AKP will be done. Um, look at parties like ANAP, um, you know, the only parties I see remaining in the long future is the CHP, um, the MHP, and, you know, others like EE, Deva, Gelecek, that, that photograph of the table of six from last year, there is nobody left from that table, right, as, as political leaders. They're all gone, right? They're, they're basically, you know, irrelevant at this point, and so will the AKP be. Once Erdogan is done, AKP is, is a shell that will just collapse. We have some seconds, Howard. Uh, centennial of Turkey. Um, is the presidential system something irreversible? Very briefly. No. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that there's uh, that that that will depend on, on who's in power and what sorts of arrangements bring the, uh, uh, that, that new president and that new parliament to power, what sort of coalitions and coalition agreements are created. So, I mean, we, we it, we're again, you know, sort of looking in the coffee grinds and trying to read the future, but I don't think anything's written in stone. Thank you, uh, Guldem, Attila. Sinan and Howard for yeah try to bring shed light on great darker moderation. Sides and... Love it. Really good yeah. questions. Well prepared. Good numbers. I like it. Um, so thank you all, and uh, let's see. Let's keep following Turkey's puzzling uh, course <laughs> until the future. Thank you again. Bye -bye.